So hey, welcome back. Um, oh, this is going to be a fun one. <clears throat> this is going to be a lot of fun. I'm saying that sarcastically. We need to talk about the border and the detention camps. And we need to do it in a way which sort of does everything it can to get as far away from the sort of shit we find playing itself out in the public eye right now. And that's because right now this entire thing seems to be drowning in semantics. So Ocasio-Cortez had the audacity to call detention centers concentration camps. All right, well, if that's too much for you, how about internment camp? Hmm? Is that fair? And even if it's not internment camp, if it's still just detention center, which at this point, let's keep in mind, we are still just going over the semantics about how to describe what are effectively holding cells, holding camps, holding facilities for civilians. Now, sure, you can say, well, they're illegals, they're criminals, they broke our laws and defied our borders. And Okay. And there's kids that we see lying on those mats. And I don't give a shit if it was Obama, Trump, Bush Sr. or Jr. or Jimmy goddamn Carter who put them there. I have a problem when I see children locked in cages. When I read reports that they're being denied basic toiletries, basic services. When you see families getting ripped apart. It's not good. It's not American. Not in the slightest. We seem to have really kind of lost track. Lost the plot in terms of what it was that we like to think makes this country great. Right? We used to be that shining city on the hill, didn't we? We were the bring me your tired and poor. Yeah. We were the land of opportunity for anyone. And furthermore, our human rights record is less than, uh, less than spotless. It's less than stellar, but the idea to it is that as a nation that we are supposed to learn from our mistakes and evolve, and then to see this playing out itself again, it's just, it, it's pretty revolting. Push the natives off the land. Effectively an American genocide. We look back on that and we find it shameful. Uh, certain chest-thumping flagophiles will say, well, it's conquest. Well, yeah, all right. Well, when it comes your way, I hope you've maintained that attitude. But then again, Japanese internment camps during World War II. We look back on that with shame, as we should. Yet we didn't learn from it, did we? Now, when it comes to these matters, right, when it comes to the matter of the border, immigration, immigration enforcement, the way we handle these things, for us to get into semantic arguments about what we're supposed to call these places, right, rather than acknowledging the facts as we find them about what these places actually are and how they function and what this border crisis really means and how it is we're going to handle it, we find ourselves just endlessly focusing on the exact verbiage that we use, who's saying it, and who we can blame. Again, it doesn't get to the heart of the matter at all, does it? Because I think there's a few elements to this that a lot of people just aren't looking at. It's a hot-button issue. A lot of people are very emotional about it. It's understandable. It's understandable in a lot of ways. There's a lot of things that need to be examined and understood and acknowledged if we're going to get the complete picture on this matter. And without the complete picture, there is no hope of solving anything at all. So let's start off with the concept of motivation. Yeah. I think it's an important one. It's oftentimes overlooked. Something which is overlooked for a number of reasons, and if it is examined, it's examined for the wrong reasons or under the wrong perspective, in my opinion. Now, this goes to a little bit of an anecdote. Years ago, I used to work in a pizza kitchen at a place called Bertucci's. It's a New England brick oven pizza chain, typically the kind of place you'd find in the mall. Parents bringing their kids for back-to-school shopping or Christmas shopping flood into these places. Really good food, too. And on a side note, if you have the opportunity to eat at Bertucci's, Give it a shot. I stole a lot of recipes from that. I make it home now. I do them better now, but beside the point. <clears throat> so when I was there, I was a cook. And when I was a cook there, the majority of the kitchen staff I worked with were immigrants, mostly Dominican. Um, I think a couple Bolivian dishwashers. Majority Spanish-speaking kitchen, right on the border in Salem, right on the border in Massachusetts. And one of these cooks was a Brazilian fellow. And after work one night, we got to talking. Had a beer at the bar, just talking about what his life was like, 
how he got in here and all this. And I found out, I said, this guy, I was making nine fifty an hour. Still kind of a poverty wage, especially in New England, but uh, I believe he was making something like seven fifty or $8 an hour. And when he left work, he'd go home to a cramped like two- or three-bedroom apartment that he shared with like a half-dozen other guys. It was basically like living in a barracks. It was like a bungalow for him. And he loved it. And he sent a portion of his pay back home to his relatives because the dollar goes a lot further down where he was from. And I started asking what it was like and how he got here. And he told me this story. It's from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Now, if you've ever seen the film City of God, I'm told that that's an overdramatic uh, portrayal of life down there, but that it's not entirely off the mark. That um, there is a lot of crime, a lot of gunplay, a lot of entrepreneurial law enforcement. Not the nicest place to raise a family, you might say. And so there this dude was growing up in that, realizing that there weren't really many opportunities for him to improve his lot in life. And he, like so many others, millions of people over the course of history, looked to that bright, shining city on a hill that is America, land of opportunity. And without the means by which to get the lawyers and the paperwork and the filing fees and the money and everything he would need to properly legally emigrate here, he decided to do it the old-fashioned way and just show up on the doorstep. So he hitchhiked and he walked from Sao Paulo, Brazil, straight through Central America, across the southern Mexican border, which is itself a bit of a dicey proposition for a number of reasons. Again, entrepreneurial law enforcement, let's call it. And he made his way through Mexico. <clears throat> then he crossed the border with the help of a coyote. And he was loaded up into a cattle truck. And he was transported in that cattle truck, like cargo, all the way from Texas to Boston. We eventually settled, I think, in like Lowell or Lawrence. Not exactly itself the greatest place to raise a family, as you might say. Um, oftentimes kind of regarded as one of the worst places in New England, but still a bit better than where he came from. And he did all of this just so that he could work, his, work himself to the bone <clears throat> in a pizza kitchen for what is effectively a poverty wage where he lives. And he loved every moment of it. Now, with this story, I didn't, you know, I found it impressive. I found it really interesting. But it wasn't initially immediately, or even today, given to this sort of knee-jerk reaction. But rather, it, it really brought something to mind. It made me realize something really important that doesn't get discussed enough in this immigration debate, and that's human motivation. You see the same thing with these caravans. You see the same thing with these families. Families, civilian families. Not narco-terrorists, not fucking Al-Qaeda, none of that. No, just ordinary people trying to improve their lot in life in the same way everybody else does. It's a funny thing, too, getting back to that pizza kitchen. Working there for nine, nine fifty an hour as I was, I did not see that as a career remotely. It's a stepping stone to something better. That fundamental human motivation to do whatever it takes to improve your circumstances. Now, I bring this up not even hoping that the you know, staunch border security enthusiast types, the build-the-wall types, are going to, like, somehow see a common humanity here. I'm past even that. More a matter of practicality. You have people, ordinary civilian people, who will put it all on the line just to come here and effectively, by most of our standards, eat shit. Now, there's a reason chicken is so cheap. There's a reason cabbage and lettuce is as cheap as it is. You know, there's a reason that we uh, here we can't have a $12 or $15 minimum wage because that would either drive prices up or put businesses out of business. Well, who do you think some of the biggest importers of illegal immigrants are? Hmm? I mean, it's not, at the moment at least, the cartels and coyotes. It's not criminal elements. It's companies like Tyson Chicken. It's agro-business, knowing that they got a whole pool of cheap labor. They even advertise in Mexico in certain places, and then they bring them up over here, and then every so often they give a little tip to ICE about a bungalow house where there's a whole bunch of Ill illegals living there. You know, he feeds them, sacrifice, so they can continue doing what they're doing. Border enforcement and ICE can feel as though they're doing what they're supposed to be doing and everyone else is happy. And we all get to continue eating cheap food because it's produced by cheap labor. It's a kind of curious thing then, isn't it? We're supposed to be told, like, oh, well, these are jobs Americans would take if they would. Do you, really, do you think so? Do you think your average American would take $7.50 an hour to toil in a field pulling cabbage? 
And the moment they did, don't you think they'd start demanding and expecting more because we have quality of life that we expect here. We're Americans, not peasants. And when they started banging on and unionizing, demanding higher wages and the like, well, wouldn't they just have robots? It's curious why robots aren't doing all the work in Tyson Chicken Factories, isn't it? But all the same, these people will risk life and limb. They will put it all on the line to get here, just so they can do that. So Maria, the housekeeper at Days Inn, can clean up your human stains <laughs> for pennies on the dollar, just because she knows that her kids will maybe get to go to an American school and have a better shot at a better life. Now, whether or not you respect their decisions, whether or not you want to shake an angry fist calling them criminals and invaders and all of that, if you can't understand and see the, the common humanity and that kind of motivation, putting everything on the line to improve your circumstances and to improve the potential future of your offspring, well, you're not really getting the point. Because that same motivation is what keeps driving them here. Regardless of even when they know that they'll end up in detention camps as they have, that they could be torn apart by their families, that motivation is still so strong they will take that risk. Because they risked a whole lot more on their way to get here. They know that if they can keep their heads down, that maybe they might be one of the lucky ones who slip under the wire and actually get that chance to live a better life. Now, we could go into all of the multinational corporate games which tend to prop up dictators and shitty politicians and shitty altogether parties in these places, as they do in South and Central America, as they have done in Southeast Asia, as they've done in parts of Africa and the Middle East, constantly causing strife and conflict in places that are resource-rich, resource rich, which ought to be flourishing, but they're not. But all the same, these people risk everything to get here. Do you really think a wall is going to stop them? Do you think troops and drones is going to stop them? And just like every other element when it comes to the notion of prohibition that's centered around something which is ingrained as a basic human motivation, whose hands do you think that this need will fall into? Who do you think will become enriched and empowered as a result of the need to get additional help in circumventing the walls, the drones, the troops, the militias? This is for all the shit we've done. Hasn't stopped them yet, has it? In fact, the only thing that's ever stemmed the tide of immigrants trying to come to this country has been when our economy was wracked because we let the banks get out of control. But we'll bail them out. Oh yeah, we'll throw billions of dollars at banks when they destroy our economies, leading to situations in which immigrants looking for better lives don't even bother coming here because they're worried that it's not going to be worth it. <laughs> Are you starting to see the point yet? Are you starting to see that just like so many of the things that we so oftentimes wish that we could just wage a war on to put an end to, that doing so will only inevitably make the situation more complex? empower bad actors in that sense. But no, let's not think too deeply on that. Let's not think too deeply about the fact that the kids lying in those pens, whether it was Obama that put them there or Trump or I don't give a damn who, let's, 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 let's overlook the fact that those are still human beings. They're not just migrants. They're not just undocumented illegals or anything like that. They're human beings brought here by human motivation. Nothing nefarious, just a desire for a better life. Let's even look past all that. Let's keep focusing on this semantic shit, you yeah? Let's blame, let's, let's figure out what parties to blame. Let's figure out what individual politicians to blame. Let's, let's keep focusing on what words we use rather than actually looking at the fundamental objective realities that we're faced with, such as the overwhelming reality that human nature, human motivation and desire is going to make this a problem regardless of what we do. And that we can't fight our way out of it any more than we can just open up the borders entirely and say, anybody who wants to come can. Because we know that's not feasible either, is it? We do need to control the flow of people who come into this country. Otherwise, we will be faced with an overburdening and overtaxing of our basic infrastructure and services. And we'll find the value of often different types of labor driven down. But what is it? What's the solution? Where's the management come in? Because I'm not hearing a lot about that. I'm hearing shit flinging matches about who's to blame. I'm here to build the wall and put guns on the border, because that's a real American thing, isn't it? Fought a whole Cold War against the Soviet Union so that we could maintain our freedom and not have to prove ourselves and show papers when we travel, and not have to have our country surrounded by guns constantly pointed outwards at every conceivable theoretical threat we've got. No. 
That's not the American way, is it? Because we can wrap ourselves in the flag all we like, but it's not going to make bad decisions any better because we've made bad decisions in the past and we're supposed to have learned from them. Now, I made a previous video about the border issue, about immigration. I don't even know if it would work, but I can't help but think that a management solution of some kind, making the legal paths here more appealing, making something worthwhile and functional, helpful, productive out of it, might be a good way to go. Now, I say this because I also recently saw on the news here, right here in New Hampshire, you know, Right here in New Hampshire, because of this anti-immigrant hysteria, which seems to be growing within certain portions of our political populations, because of the sort of ideological pushes that certain parties are pushing for, there are a handful of veterans, military veterans, men who signed up to the U.S. military in wartime, deployed overseas to go and serve in wartime to serve this country, who did so because they were offered a path to citizenship through military service. And frankly, for my part, I really can't think of a, a more uh, rich and robust way to demonstrate your love and dedication to a country you want to call your home than putting your life on the line and serving in its military during a time of war. And they've had that citizenship put on hold. It's put on hold because of Trump administration policies right now. Now that is frankly disgusting, but at the same time it also does bring us once again back to the question of human motivation. Because one thing that has been getting under my skin quite a bit with the uh, ultra-nationalists who seem to be really loving on this issue, they really love harping on this issue of immigration. From my perspective, somebody who serves in the military or somebody who risks life and limb just to come to this country so that they can live at the most basic bottom level of the society that we have here demonstrates a hell of a lot more love and dedication to this country than somebody who just happened to fall out of their mother over its soil. Talk about flag burning. We seem to have no problem with the same people who are probably on board with banning that, turning it into blazers and hats and underwear. Hmm? Ask yourself, what kind of Americans do we want? Do we want those who are dedicated to the country, or do we simply want natives? It's really hard to say, isn't it? Especially given our history. If we're going to find ourselves addressing this issue productively, seriously, in an actual practical manner, we're going to have to get beyond these semantics. We're going to have to get beyond this partisan shit. We're going to have to start analyzing, honestly, what's driving immigration and figure out ways to manage the flow rather than put an end to it. Because we waged a war on drugs and it didn't work. We tried alcohol, prohibition, it doesn't work. And I'll tell you this much, if you ban abortion, there's going to be a whole lot of black market clinics, back alley, wire hanger abortions going on. All of these things, it all comes back to escalation and the nature of motivation. I still think that a National Service Corps would be a damn fine idea. Instead of paperwork and tests and monies and fees and filing fees and lawyers and court hearings, give them a program. Put together a program. Semi-militaristic. Basic-ass bungalow housing for applicants and their immediate families. Visa, green card status while they're here. They'll be put to work doing things like disaster relief have more and more disasters, don't we? We always seem to be arguing over whether or not anything should be done to help with the relief efforts. Well, if you've got a, if you've got a ready service of people who are coming here and they'll do anything to live here, and they're willing to actually go into these programs in exchange for that, or alternately military service, same thing. Service for citizenship. What's wrong with that? Get all the bureaucracy and nonsense red tape out of the way. Because I'll tell you this much. If a program bringing them in the way Tyson Chicken does, which utilizes coyotes so that they can go work for poverty wages that are well below the minimum wage and chicken plants just to be offered up to ICE every so often so that everyone can save face and look like they're doing their jobs. If they can manage to do that, why can't we do it in a productive way that actually serves this nation? That lets the people who want to live here and be citizens here demonstrate their worth 
by giving us service. And in the meantime, we can even have, we can even offer them and their families things like education in how the basics of our society work, about uh, the differences between where they're from and where they are now. We can have them go into English language courses because that's always a big contention, isn't it? We got to save the English language. Even though I'm not of the opinion that the language of Shakespeare really needs saving. All the same. When I see this debate raging on, there is so much raw emotion and so much nationalistic chest thumping and ideological terror stomping. I don't really see a solution until we're able to actually calm down and reevaluate the situation on the grounds by which it actually exists. Those being the motivations of the people who are trying to come here, how far they're willing to go to get here, how much they're willing to risk to get here, and what, honestly, what kind of deterrence could potentially dissuade them given what they're already facing. And then at the same time, to acknowledge the fact that they are going to continue to stream here because this is, to them, still the shining city on the hill, the promised land, the land of opportunity. And if maybe instead of trying to find ways to even just feel good by letting them all in and dealing with the consequences or alternately fighting our way away from it and erecting giant walls and putting guns and drones and shit on the border, maybe finding a way to actually turn this all to our advantage. Because this nativist nationalistic mentality that I see dominating one side and the proposed open borders, wide-eyed idealism on the other is not going to get us anywhere. And in the meantime, the human beings whose lives, human beings whose lives are being held in the middle, they're being erased. They're just turned into statistics. They're turned into talking points. And that's not the America I know. That's not America at all. We're supposed to be better than the people who did this before, which is why we oppose them. Let's try and remember that. Let's try and figure out a better way forward. I right, so hey guys, thanks for sitting through that video. I hope I don't lose too many of you as a result. Um, as always, hit like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, links down below if you want to support the channel. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you next one.